think anyone can read Thomas Jefferson's public papers, his speeches, his inaugural addresses, and particularly his statute of Virginia for religious freedom and disagree. Because the essence and the element of every public comment he makes on religion is for the benefit of the individual in securing their rights to carry their communion with their maker as they should choose. It is always in Jefferson's writings and opinion the freedom for religion. He rarely, if ever, writes a freedom of religion, implying in that, and Jefferson's very cautious uh, uh, as a wordsmith. He, he's always searching for the precise words that will clarify what he means, and he is, does not mean a separation of religion from our lives or from the lives of those we elect to office. It's always a freedom for religion. And it is the separation between church and state, not the separation of church and state. So it's the separation between the ecclesiastical laws and the civil authority. And that's going to provide a greater freedom for religion. First and foremost, a greater freedom for the civil authority to serve its duty. For Jefferson is adamant, as many others realize, the only duty of government and its laws is to protect people from injury by one another. Otherwise, to keep them free, to pursue their own industry and their own improvement, as Jefferson says. And at the same time, to keep religion and ecclesiastical law free, so that they can pursue its duty. The duty of ecclesiastical law is to protect the soul, to administer to the soul. So when you think of it in that context, which is the context Jefferson is purporting, you have more freedom for religion. And as a consequence, the recognition, as Jefferson said, the freedom for religion provides the greatest energy for any civilization. And there it is. The whole sum of religion, in Jefferson's opinion, is to do unto others as you would desire to have done unto yourself, to love your neighbor as you should love yourself. When a people are free to do that, when they aren't restrained or coerced against their inner beliefs to, to do that, how can you fail to create a more convivial sense and a greater sense of brotherhood and, and working together for the, for the common man? And that's how it's worked for 200 years. We fail to realize that, that we've gone 200 years without battle, without war, without bloodshed, fought on our soil over a difference of religious opinion. Look what's still going on in the rest of the world. I mean, I'm not saying extensively over the rest of the world, but this is a prime provocation for wars and, and bloodshed. And Jefferson would say, is that religion? Now, when we get into his private writings, like all of us, Jefferson questions. Have we forgotten why Jesus threw the money lenders out of the temple? I mean, what was he implying there? What was that action all about? Jefferson says the morals, the teachings and morals of Jesus are the most sublime upon the planet. So his concern is once religion becomes an administration, it is going to be subjected to the nature of man to corrupt. And he, 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 if men were angels, governments would not be necessary. And yet he's saying we must have continual overseeing and inspection of any government by the people themselves because he has a belief in the, uh, the beneficence and the faith and trust of his fellow man. And that, he says, is the sum of all religion. The teachings of all the world's great divines are faith and trust in mankind. But that's not to deny that man can be corrupt. This is his problem with a national bank. Is it going to be governed by a board of directors? Are they less fallible than someone else? May they not be interested in their own personal investments than the investment of the common man? The same thing in religion, organized religion. It may become a business rather than religion. So that's his warning. It's his warning, and you find it in his private papers. And he's discussing this with Adams. He's discussing this with Washington. In fact, we forget. This is wonderful. This is in the Annus, Jefferson's collection of conversations uh, that he remembered during different periods in, in the uh, early history of the government. Uh, when Washington was elected, 
there was all this great concern. Well, how? what is his opinion on religion? How does he believe it's as associated with the national government now? So Washington is besieged by a number of, um, of divines, clerics and, and the like, who come to see him in Philadelphia, where the capital is. And uh, so Washington greets them in the reception room of the president's house in Philadelphia. They go into another chamber. They close the doors to start asking Washington how does he feel about church and state. And after 20 minutes, Washington has not said a thing, nothing. And Jefferson in his Adams said, uh, Jefferson in his Ad Annus writes, the old fox showed them without saying a word that it is not his duty nor his office to provide a comment or to provide any influence. So this was the feeling of the founding fathers, uh, that we keep it separate, and that provides more freedom for the individual. Jefferson, it is unique in amongst this, uh, this argument and contention, Jefferson was baptized in the Church of England, as was his father and his forebears, generally. He, his father was a vestryman of the Church of England in Albemarle County, as Jefferson became. He almost inherited that seat on the vestry and remained on the vestry of St. Anne's Parish in Albemarle County when we began to create the American Episcopal Church. In fact, Jefferson was one of the big promoters of the episcopacy of the American Episcopal Church. Uh, presided over by American bishops. He wrote the prayer for our nation in the Episcopal Prayer Book. He was on the board of directors of the American Bible Society. He also designed the very first church in Charlottesville, which was begun the year before he died in 1825, the uh, uh, Christ Episcopal Church in Charlottesville. You never hear that because he kept it quiet, it was private, it was unto himself, and that's what he believed religion should be, that one is free to carry their communion with the makers they should choose. I do not inquire of anyone's religion, nor do I bother them with my own. A person's religion is solely between them and their maker. Deism, I find it curious. There's, I've never understood what is so offensive about deism. It's the recognition of a prime mover of God, it's a recognition of that manifestation through the life of Jesus and his words and teachings. It does presume that God stands back and removes himself from the affairs of men, but then is that not what is meant by God's work on this planet must truly be our own? If, you, if there is a communion with him, then that must be engaged by us. And it is also, it's not a religion. It's, it's more or less a frame of mind and tenets and charges that are very much a part of Freemasonry. So when you look at Freemasonry and its influence in the creation of this nation, you're looking at deism.